In the last video, we showed that continuous functions preserve the topological property of connectedness in their forward images. If E is a connected subset of the domain of a function, and that function is continuous, then the image F of E is a connected subset of the range. But that makes our friend the calculus enjoyer nothing? Not, nothing for me today? Okay, all right, I, I, think, I, I think he's not coming. That makes the calculus enjoyer impatient. Right. Who cares? Why are we doing this? Does this have anything to do with the calculus that we learned in high school, college, whatever? Um, so this video is a who cares video. There's a very good answer to why a calculus student would care about this result, but I don't want to give that to you up front. If you want to see the answer and get spoiled, forward to the next video. Uh, but in this video, we're going to sort of talk through the who cares. How can we take this topological result and discover what it is about this result that should make us care about it in a calculus classroom? So, the forward image of a connected set is connected under a continuous function. So what? You know, why should we care? Well, we should care because of the other thing that we know about connected sets. And we know something about connected sets that's very particular to the topology of the real number line. We had a definition when we were first introduced to connected sets of what it means for a subset of the real numbers to be called an interval. This is where we, we get to take that question, not lifting our pencil means continuous. We get to take that question seriously. And the way we take it seriously is by thinking about sets that also have that no gaps property. Those are called the intervals as subsets of the real numbers. So remember, an interval is a subset of the real numbers that has the property that whenever we have three real numbers, a, b, and c, where c is strictly in between a and b, and if a and b happen to be members of my set, i, that will guarantee that c, the thing which is in between a and b, is also a member of the set i. So an interval is a subset of the real numbers that has no gaps between any of its elements. If you give me two elements that belong to an interval, then I can tell you every real number in between those two also must belong to that same interval. So intervals are subsets of the real numbers that have no gaps in between any of their elements. And we sort of had this idea because this was our original notion of not lifting my pencil in a way that if I want to shade in an interval on the real line, I can do that without ever lifting up my pencil along the real line, right? because I'm going to hit everything in between. And so we had this really important theorem that if we are content to restrict ourselves to the real line and subsets of the real line, then there is no difference between connected sets in the topological sense right, of having no non-trivial, non-empty, disjoint, open covers and the idea of being an interval, not having any gaps between any of its elements with respect to the usual ordering of real numbers. So for subsets of the real line, there is no difference between being an interval and being a connected set. Everything which is one of them is also the other. And so what that allows us to do is to take this hard fought victory from the previous video, that the image of a connected set under a continuous function is connected in the topological sense, and specialize that to the case of the real number system in which connected is the same thing as interval. It's the same thing as no gaps. And so if I replace that word connected in this with the word interval, we get this immediate corollary that if you have a function from the real numbers to the real numbers and you give me a subset of the domain of that function, which is an interval, a subset which includes every x value in between any two of its x values, then we will be able to deduce that the image of that set is also an interval. And the image is going to be a subset of the codomain, or the range, if you like, of my function. So we're going to think of those as being the y values. And so the fact that the image is an interval means between any two of the y values that this function attains will be values in between which are also being attained by this function. Now this is starting to sound, hopefully, a little bit familiar from your calculus course. Let's unpack it just a little bit more. So to say that a subset of the domain of my function is an interval, that means that if you give me an a and a b that belong to the domain of my function, and a c, which is in between a and b, strictly greater than a and strictly less than b, that must mean that c is also a part of my domain, which is kind of interesting, but it's kind of more interesting to apply that same reasoning to f of a. 
that if you give me three y values, if you like, u, v, and w, and if u and v are in the image f of a, and w is in between them, then we will be able to deduce from this theorem that w must also belong to the image of a. And just unpacking the definition of the image of a set is going to allow us to say that if we pick any a and b that belong to the domain of my function, and if a and b are different from one another, so that I can actually have some c's that are in between them, then we can just apply the function f to a and also to b. And that's going to give me two numbers, u and v, f of a and f of b, respectively, that are in the image of a. And then the conclusion of this theorem is that if you take any w that's in between f of a and f of b, then that w will also belong to the image of a. But belonging to the image of a means that w is equal to f of something that came from the set a. So w is equal to f of c. So sort of reading what we have here, if you give me an a and a b in the domain of my function on the real numbers, and we pick any w that's in between the y values, f of a and f of b, we will be able to find another x value, c, which is between a and b, and which realizes the y value, w. This is the result which, in calculus, we call the intermediate value theorem. The intermediate value theorem says that for a continuous function on a set e, Every continuous function has what we call the Darboo property on every closed interval, a, b, which is a subset of e. And just to unpack, what do we mean by the Darboo property? We mean exactly this thing which is mentioned over here. If you give me an a and a b, such that a is strictly less than b, and both of them belong to my domain, e. And if you give me any y value, w, that's between the y values, f of a and f of b, then... Well, by the way, we don't know which is greater and which is less, right? depending on whether the function is increasing or decreasing on average on the interval from a to b. Um, we might have that f of b is less than f of a, in which case we would wedge w in between them in the other order. So it doesn't really matter. Um, as long as f of a and f of b are different from one another, we can pick a w that's in between them, strictly in between them on the real line. And the conclusion of the Darboo property is that there exists a c between a and b such that f of c is equal to w. So this is the intermediate value theorem from calculus. The intermediate value theorem from first semester calculus is true because this topological property about continuous functions is true, not just for functions of the real numbers, but for functions on any topological space, anywhere that we can define connectedness using the open set definition of connectedness. Connectedness is something that continuous functions preserve in the forward image because precisely continuous functions preserve openness in their inverse images. But when we specialize that to the case of functions on the real line, on the real line, connectedness means being an interval, means assuming every value in between any two given values uh, on the real number system. And when I apply it to that circumstance, what, I, what immediately falls out is the intermediate value theorem from single variable calculus. And the intermediate value theorem is just another way to say that continuous functions take on every single value in between any two values that they take on. Continuous functions cannot skip over any y values on the way from one y value to another y value. Kind of another way to think about it. And that vindicates, in a way, the calculus enjoyers claim that continuity means never having to lift our pencil. We don't have to lift our pencil for a continuous function because a continuous function takes on every y value in between any two of its y values. That's the content of the intermediate value theorem. And it's now something that we have proven. By proving the more general statement of how continuous functions interact with connected sets in any topological space, and then just plugging in the fact that we know about con uh, connected subsets of the real line always being intervals, having no gaps between any two of their values. And when we do that, the intermediate value theorem that you learned in your first semester of calculus is an immediate conclusion. So I think that's pretty cool, right? This is where we're starting to finally see the payoff of all the, the sort of topological stuff that we've done up until this point in the semester, is that now we can deduce this theorem without having to get fussy about it. All we had to know was that continuous functions preserve connectedness in their forward image, and that in the real number system, connectedness means being an interval, and vice versa. So there is no difference. In the next couple of videos, we're going to try to arrive at another theorem in calculus, um, 
instead of by looking at connectedness, we want to look at another topological property that we've met recently, the property of compactness. So what can we learn about the properties of continuous functions in calculus by studying how continuous functions interact with compact sets? And that's going to be the next stop in our journey.